Amen. It's so awesome. I was thinking the other day, you know, I'd be out in the garden and I'd be just, you know, meditating on things. And I remember he was showing me about um, roots and I was wondering, I was just meditating on roots and how it was in the design of the father and his son for plants to have roots. And what the roots do is they search. They go out from the seed and they go searching for the nutrients, the water, and everything that it needs. And as far the bigger trees and the bigger plants, what you'll find is that they have bigger roots. They have deeper roots that search out further than some of the weaker plants do. And I was just meditating on that. And I was like, man, God, I thank you. Because sometimes we wonder why we just don't know everything right away. But I do believe there's a part in, in God where he really does want us to search. He really does want us to search him out and search his ways is what the scripture says. And so we should always be delighted in searching out the things of God. Even when we don't have answers to the question, search it out. You know, pray about it. Go on the scriptures and study it and ask the Holy Spirit um, to lead you and guide you. I think Father enjoys the dance sometimes. I really do. I think he enjoys the uh, relationship, the communication, and the digging that we do. Because all these things are built into creation. And so there's an understanding and there's some wisdom here that we should apply to things in God. I know sometimes, you know, we, um, we, we want to be like those baby plants, you know, where everything is just given to them all the time, all the time. So they don't really have to search. Matter of fact, they actually proved that if you water like uh, some trees too much, like if you give them too much artificial water, like you're constantly watering them in their use stage, they don't, they don't set out roots as deep as they could go. They don't set out roots as far as they can go. Matter of fact, um, they said if you water very shallow too much, in other words, you just give a little bit of water each day, instead of giving a good deep watering, the plants and the trees develop really shallow roots. And so when the time comes, when it's a drought and there's no water, they haven't developed the root system they need to really be able to pull in the nutrients that's really gonna sustain them. And so I'm saying that to say there's so much revelation wisdom in the things that the father has made by his son. And, and we have to uh, understand these things. And this is one of those topics I felt like I had to search out, even though it's in the scripture, even though um, there were things that I think are kind of plain when you go into the scriptures and relook at these things. Um, I, I, I enjoy the searching out part. I enjoy searching and studying and, and digging out uh, in order to find um, the truth, in order to find out what it is that he's saying in the scriptures. Amen. So we're going to continue our study in the truth about Sabbath. And I've been so blessed to just be able to talk about these things. Uh, there's been some testimonies um, or a testimony that someone had. Uh, when they get on the line, I'll ask them to share that um, about it as well. But we just thank God for everything that's already been established and that we can walk in in our day and time, amen? So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And here we go again, I gotta find that button and I never can, oh, here it is right here. All right, nope, share screen, share screen one. Bam, that's what I want right there, all right. Clean that. Hit the reset real quick, Revelations 18 and three. This is this class. We are still dealing with the kingdom versus the Babylon versus the kingdom. We're still dealing with that understanding, understanding that we are called to come out of the things of Babylon and come out of the things that the beast or um, the kingdom of darkness has influenced the world in. Amen. And so we're seeing right here in Revelation 18 and 4, I heard a voice of heaven coming out saying, come out of her, my people, let you not be partakers of her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Amen. It says, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. It says, for all nations, in verse 3, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, okay, which is impurity, which is mixing, which is um, an intercourse, if you will, more of a spiritual thing where we're mixing and combining, and we are uh, synchronizing uh, with things that are not of God, amen. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. In other words, the leaders of these nations are in cahoots, are in agreement with the system. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And we've dealt with all of that many, many times. The merchants 
in the scripture, it simply means those that are rich, those that are, uh, are, are engaged in the buying and selling. And that's so amazing because this was written thousands of years ago. When you look at our time, those who really are ruling and running this world really are the merchants. They really are those that run businesses and have, you know, a, a high amounts of, um, you know, status and income. I showed you all that list some, some months ago, showing you who the richest people in the world were, were, and mostly all of them dealt with buying and selling. They were all dealing in the area of being a merchant. Amen. So the scripture is very clear of what we will be seeing in our day and the things that are going on. Amen. And so one scripture that I want to look at in remembrance that, you know, we are in a, in a time where we are living in a world um, that really does have two kingdoms. There's actually, as I said before, there's really only one kingdom, and that's the kingdom of God. But there's this other kingdom that's out there that's going to be judged. It's already been judged. It's already declared uh, that they will be judged. And, and what uh, the end will be of that kingdom, it's a kingdom that exists by default. Uh, because if you choose not to do the ways of, of, of the Most High and the ways of the Father, then you, you by default, are already in the, the kingdom of darkness. We talked about that before um, as well, but I wanna go real quick because I wanted to hit this one scripture that we didn't hit last week. And it's gonna go to Daniel chapter seven, verse 25. And I wanna illuminate something that was prophesied in Daniel in his time, amen. And so when we go to Daniel chapter seven, verse 25, he's talking about the beast and he's talking about the images and some revelation that he has concerning that and the things that are gonna be happening um, in this system. And this is what he says right here. And this is probably familiar to some of y'all that's on the call, but it says, and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until a time and a times of the dividing of time. Amen. But the judgment shall, they shall uh, sit and they shall take away his kingdom his dominion to consume and to destroy it until the end. Amen. So one of the key things that we, we take note here of the beast system and the system of, of Babylon is that it says that he will seek to wear out the saints of the most high. And I talked about that before and in Revelations, it says that the beast or that, that harlot makes war with the saints. And so it's our adversary, that system, the king, the leaders, and all that are in cahoots with it. They are our adversaries, okay? They are against the kingdom of God and they are against the ways of God, amen? And so he, he attempts to wear out the saints. And one of the ways they wear out the saints is won by persecution. And that's one of the ways that they did it in the first, uh, second, third centuries. And even back, even in the times of Israel, you know, they would kill the prophets, they would kill the believers, uh, they would persecute um, for your faith, for your belief. They would try to get you to worship other gods, try to get you to bow down to magistrates and certain things of that sort. And so um, believers and, uh, were always persecuted for their beliefs and um, for holding fast to the faith um, that they had. Um, and other things that he does is he tries to change times and laws. Okay, and this is, this is big because as we've been talking about, we've been talking about appointed times and set times of the most high and, and the ways that he is establishing. And I'm gonna get to the laws another day because we gotta deal with the laws as well. But one thing we have to understand is, and you can see this clearly when you read the scriptures is, you know, our God is very detailed, <laughs> okay? He, he's detailed and he has established things and he's particular about these things that he's established, amen? I think sometimes we take those things kind of lightly uh, or we don't really understand the meaning, but one thing we have to realize, is he always does things for a reason. It's not like he just, oh, this would be a good idea, I'll do this. No, it's there's a reason why he does what he does, amen. And so if we really begin to think about uh, his ways, his, his, the word and, and the laws and, and these things in that way, I believe you'll start to get greater revelation and wisdom around what um, he has done and what he has established, amen. So don't think it's strange that we are in a country and we're in a time where the, the months and the calendars and the years don't follow the scripture. Don't think it's strange that, you know, there are, there's a confusion around um, times and the things of God. Don't think it's strange that, you know, there is a, a church that it, it has gone into apostasy and does uh, teach the ways of the world, but they add Christ and add Jesus into the mix of it. 
you know, we can't think that that is strange because these things were prophesied that they were going to happen. And these are some of the signs that uh, we are in the era that the scripture was talking about. Amen. And so we as people of God have to take and heed the call to come out of her, as the scripture says. And that's why some of y'all are on the call. And that's why some have been chiming in and catching up with the things that are going, you know, that because he really is reviving the church and reforming the church. Amen. But we have to be willing to hear and be willing to listen. Amen. And most and most of all, be willing to do. Amen. And so I thank God that he has been revealing these things to, to the people of God. Um, so we can be blessed and that we can be lockstep in step with what he is doing. And it's so funny because I've been hearing this word, these words in my head since I've been teaching this, um, because we, like I said, we've been keeping, you know, the Shabbat for about four or five years and we've just been doing it our own and I haven't been preaching or teaching it to anybody. I remember I had said a couple of things to some people about it before, but it wasn't anything that I was, um, you know, hitting people over the head with. And I remember after last week, teaching i heard the words um divine providence uh after the class was taught and i and i heard and it, and it came to my spirit is walking in divine providence and I, so i was like divine providence and i was just it just kind of resonated and i just finally went and looked it up and divine providence means it means to really to delight in all of the authority and the things that have been established by god and when you walk in divine providence it's like you're walking in the divine will of the Father, amen. And so I, I'm, I'm still waiting to get more revelation for what that means when we talk about divine providence. And later, please, if somebody has revelation on that, feel free to chime in. Uh, but again, I wanna go back to what we talked about last week and kind of build from that. And the first thing was the Sabbath was really always meant to be a blessing. I, again, I remember I said last week, if you remember anything from this teaching, if you decide, you know, you're not there yet, or you still kind of mulling it over or, or whatever, please remember it was meant to be a blessing, okay? And it was always designed to be a blessing. We're gonna look at what people have made it into, which makes it look like it's a curse, which makes it look like it's this big burden, like it's this thing that we should be forgetting about or we should be um, trying to run away from. <laughs> um, but one thing I wanna say, and this is what I heard even as I began to meditate on it more was, did he unbless it? You know, so we read in Genesis chapter two last week, it said, for he sanctified the seventh, the sixth, uh, the seventh day and blessed it and, and made it uh, holy. And let's look at it real quick because I don't want to misquote that scripture because it's a good, important scripture. And it says on the seventh day, God entered his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And that's Genesis chapter two, verse two. And he blessed the seventh day. OK, so we see him blessing a day and sanctified it. In other words, set apart because we as his believers are also called to be sanctified. Okay, so he's always been sanctifying and setting things apart. And things that he sets apart are the things which are holy. Okay, and I can go a whole day teaching on sanctification and holiness, but it's important to understand that because he's been sanctifying things from the beginning. Okay, because there was an understanding coming into this world that things were going to have to be divided. In this world we live in, from the beginning, revelation was already in place that I got to divide. There's going to be a division, okay? And if I go back to Genesis and deal with that, you know, he talks about he divided the night, the night from the day, okay? And the first thing he did was separate the light from the darkness. See, these are natural things, but they're also spiritual. There was always going to be a separation in this earth because he knew mankind will go into the way of sin. So he was always going to be separating the good from the evil he's going to be separating light from the darkness and there was an understanding that his kingdom was going to be set differently than the ways of the world amen so he says here he blessed that day and sanctified it because in that he had rested from all his work which god created and made what's great about this and interesting about this we see god blessing and sanctifying different things throughout the scripture all right we see him um blessing and sanctifying um space so in other words, a space or a place. So he sanctified the tent, the tabernacle, remember? He said, I'm gonna place my spirit there. I have hollowed this place is what the scripture says, and I have sanctified it. And I, I taught uh, some year, uh, prior a year or so ago that only God can set apart and make something whole, amen? Because it's really in his power to set things apart and make it sanctified and holy. Because see, we might think we can make something holy, but we can't. 
And I showed you all through the scripture, though, it's only God that can make something holy and sanctify something and set it apart. Amen. So we see him sanctifying places at times, tabernacle. We see the temple being uh, at the, the temple of Solomon being sanctified after it was built. But it was sanctified, of course, according to them keeping the laws, the commandments and the statutes. He said, I'll place my spirit in this place as long as you keep my word, keep my law, keep my statutes and my ordinances. He said, I'll cause this place to be a place of prayer and I'll allow my spirit to be in this place. Amen. So we see him sanctifying a space. We see him sanctifying and setting apart people. Amen. When we talk about the ecclesia or the church, the ecclesia, the word ecclesia comes from the word, uh, I think it's ecclesis or kleo, which means to call out. So he's called you out and set you apart, which is be sanctified. Amen. And so he's called us out of the world and sanctified us and set us apart and made us holy. All right. And so we see him sanctifying and setting apart spaces, people. And in Genesis chapter two, we see him sanctifying and setting apart time. All right. So we see these three different categories. And there's probably more out there. I'm sure if you search the scripture, you'll find more things that are blessed and sanctified and set apart. But this one's interesting because it's time. It's a time that is holy, sanctified and set apart. And it's interesting because it's done very, very early in the scripture. We're seeing it in Genesis chapter two. So a couple of things you can take away from that is number one, it predates the law of, Mo of Moshe or Moses, even though the law of Moses, a lot of the laws of Moses weren't necessarily all laws that came at the time of Moses. Some of those laws were old, had already been laws uh, or, or things that the people of God already knew about. They just hadn't been written down. I can get into that another day. But we clearly see here, he's saying, I blessed that day, I sanctified it and made it holy and set it apart, amen. And so we have to take note again that these things are significant. And so I asked the question, well, did he unbless it? Well, of course we know that's, that's not true because if you know the scripture, you know that once a blessing's been pronounced, there's no really unblessing that thing, amen. Let's go to Numbers 23 and 13 and we'll see a couple of examples of when things are pronounced and blessed, um, we don't undo those things, amen, 23 and 13. This is about Balak, okay? And I'm gonna read a couple of verses here. It says, and Balak said unto him, come and pray with me into another place from which you may see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them and shall not see them all and curse me from this. So this is Balak talking about, he wants them to curse the children of Israel. And so they wanted him to, you know, curse the children of Israel so they could, you know, overtake them, okay? And this, so this is what this discourse is talking about. Um, okay, so we'll skip down to verse 18. He said, and he took up the parable and said, rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippah. Okay, and this is the Lord speaking to him. And God is not a man that he should not, she, he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He, he hath said, shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken it and shall not make it good? He said, behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Okay, so when he's when he's blessing something, I thank God we serve a God that doesn't reverse. Amen. The Bible talks about the gift of God being the gift of God being without repentance. He knew Israel was going to do what they did, but he still blessed them. He still gave them the blessing. He still gave them the land. He still brought them into the place. He knew what they were going to do, but he still blessed it because he already decided in his heart that he was going to bless them. He'd already told Abraham, your people are going to be blessed. I'm going to bless the nations in the world because of your seed. These things have already been spoken. He's not undoing it. Amen. And so we understand when things are blessed and they're pronounced blessed by the Most High, it's done. Amen. We can see another example of that. Uh, if you go to Genesis um, 27 and looking at the 28th verse, very popular passage, we know about Esau and Jacob. And I used to read the story like, man, no. You know the whole story about Esau and Jacob, how you know, um, you know how he stole, not stole, but he basically, you know, swindled the birthright from Esau. And so a lot of us were reading this story, thinking about now, why couldn't he just undo what he said and just give it to Esau? Because that was right. That seemingly what the right thing to do was. Amen. But if we go down to 33. And we know he, you know, Isaac pretended he was Esau, so forth and so on. And it said 24, and when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried uh, with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. He said, thy brother come with subtlety 
and have taken away thy blessing. And he said, it is not, is he not, not rightly named Jacob for he supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, he had taken away my blessing. And he said, thou hast not reserved a blessing from me. Amen. And so that birthright blessing, once it was pronounced, it was not being able to be undone. So I, I'm, I'm using these examples to show you that when something is blessed, when something has been the, uh, pronounced to be blessed in the spirit realm and in the things of God, we don't, we don't undo those things. Okay. And so this is important when we get into the whole talk about the Sabbath day being abolished. Okay. Cause we're going to get into that and we're going to get into a little bit of reasons why, you know, that is a thought that prevails today, or that's a thought that has been taught in the Christian church. But again, we got to be very careful because the scriptures are, you know, when you search these things out, and like I said last week, you know, a lot of times we've been taught things before we've searched these things out. So we go into the Bible trying to prove out what we think, as opposed to reading what it says. Amen. And I can't reiterate enough how dangerous that is, because you'll come to a lot of false conclusions if you do things that way. And that's actually called eisegesis, right? That's you're going into the scriptures with an isolated thought. And you're trying to prove it out rather than the exegete to study the scripture and find out what it is saying. Amen. And you know how I say in this class, I'm really big on um, studying the scripture, figuring out what it says, but then also looking historically to determine, okay, if these things are true, where was it changed at? And I think that's a big part of, you know, understanding these things. Of course, everything can always be proven historically. But as I've showed you in this class, a lot of the things that I've taught on whether it be church leadership, whether it be the things about the temple, whether it be some of these things that you know, I feel that the Lord has showed me, I've also showed you in the scripture or in the history where these things have changed, where people were doing something and then somebody came and changed it and did something different. And then we kind of can see how we got to where we are today. Amen. So the Sabbath was always meant to be a blessing. That's the key thing to remember. The Bible talks about it being a day of refreshing, being a day to be restored. You know, and so we're going to talk about um, uh, get a little bit into that day as well. We talked about also that rest was built into all the creation. I'm not going to go back into this, but it's already been programmed into everything. It's been programmed in your body. It's been programmed into the animals. It's been programmed into the the nature. It's been programmed into the sun and the moon. It's just what's been established, amen. And so for us to kind of not pay attention to that, it means we're really not paying attention to the sovereignty and the providence of God and the things that he has already put in place. Amen. We talked about that the Sabbath day was part of the Ten Commandments. All the commandments up in here are, are still followed today. These are all still valid commandments. Yes, the Spirit of God helps us to keep all the law. The Bible talks about if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Christ said, this hang on all the law and the prophets. Now, why did he say that? He said, because this, he said, if you love God with all your heart, your mind, and soul, and your strength, and have a general and, and real love for your neighbor, you're going to find that a lot of these laws were really built and designed because number one, the matters relationships, matters relationships with you and God, and also matters relationships with you and your neighbor and the people in your, in the nation. Um, and that really, they were meant to be something that helps you to reflect on the ways of God. Amen. And so when we look at all these commandments, they're all valid. These are things we have to still keep. We're not supposed to steal. We're not supposed to kill people. We're still supposed to honor our mother, our mother and our father. We're still not supposed to have any other gods before God. We're not supposed to make images to worship and all these other things. And right there, number four, it still says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, when you go to that scripture in the Bible, he actually goes on a discourse in the commandment. He says, for six days, thou hast cr created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, I rested. And he says, so he's basically saying again, this is a special day and a special time that I have blessed and set appointed, uh, set apart for you and the people of God. Amen. And so that's why it's so, uh, so good to remember the Sabbath, to remember the day and to keep it set apart. Amen. And I can, I'm, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I, even as I read that now, I really can look at it and see why that is so important important to remember it and to keep it holy because when we look at our world today we can see the effects of not keeping this day and keeping these times that the father has set matter of fact we might as well get into it 
you know, when we think about the Babylon kingdom, we think about this world system, you know, as I said last week, the reason there's seven days in a week was because of, because of the scripture. It's because of, this is something God established. And yeah, there were other countries who had, or nations who had different days of the week. But just imagine if there was 15 days in a week or 20 days in a week, you know, or you was on this weird calendar and, and, and the 20th day was a day of rest. So you'd have to work 19 days before you get a rest day. But the way the father had already set this up and appointed it was it's six days of work and on the seventh you rest. And there's many, many scriptures that repeat this over and over again. On six days I work, the seventh day I rest. Amen. And so we can see that this is true because not only is the seven day week still being used even this day, the seventh day being the last day, um, we can even look throughout history and out time to understand, well, even historically, people were really not working on Shabbat. Okay, so even like, if you remember, there's a reason why people work Monday through Friday, mostly. Amen. And that's, there's some history to that. But basically, um, the, the, the history was people actually were working Monday through Friday. And some of that came from, you know, the industrial work time and so forth and so on. But historically, people were not working on Shabbat, especially those who considered themselves Hebrew. Okay, so they weren't working on the Shabbat. As a matter of fact, after the time of Christ, you know, the Roman or the Gentile Christians in the kingdom also were keeping, were not really working on the Shabbat, but they were also having what you would call a fellowship on Sunday, okay, on, on the first day of the week. And I'm going to get to that later. So they didn't work that day either, okay? Some people didn't. And then, and then later on, what ended up happening was, you know, um, you know, there was some discrepancy because, you know, uh, in some of these places, people were working on, on Shabbat. And so the, the Hebrews or the Jews got mad. And then they were telling the Jews and the Hebrews, well, you got to work on Sunday because you didn't work Saturday. So you had to work Sunday to make up your time. And then the believers or the Christians got mad and said, well, that's our day of worship. We don't, we don't want them working on that day either. <laughs> so that's how you got to the spot of people working. One of the ways you got to Monday through Friday being a week and typically people not working Saturday and Sunday. It's a little bit of a wrinkle in the, in the history there, but I'm gonna show you also historically that people really were not working on Shabbat uh, for a while and that the whole thing of it being changed from Saturday to Sunday, there's a point in time in history when that happened, amen. And we'll be able to pinpoint that and I'll show you, amen. So we talked about a little bit of the confusion last week. Key thing I want you to remember is in, in 2 Corinthians 3 and 15. Let's go there real quick. Because that's such an important scripture, especially in, in this study as we continue to move forward. <clears throat> but even unto this day, this is verse 15. When Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. I can't say enough how good and how amazing that scripture is and how much it really does pinpoint what it means to have the spirit of God, have to have the spirit of the father in us. Amen. Because we have the veil taken away because we've turned to the Lord, okay? Because if you don't, when Moses is read, the veil is on your heart, okay? And so you'll clearly see there's a difference between those who have the veil and those who do not have the veil, okay? And so what it means to not have the veil, and I read this last week, remember we went into Matthew, and we looked at the discourse of Christ, and he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And to fulfill means to bring clarity, to show you how to, how to fulfill it, or to, um, or to do it perfectly, how to be perfect in doing it, okay? And so then he goes on to go through these laws and he gives you the, the version without the veil, amen? He goes on to talk about, you've heard it before said this, I'm telling you this, he's removing the veil. He's showing you spiritually, this is what you should have arrived at. This is really the depth or the spiritual meaning of what, you, of what these laws meant. Amen. And I'm not going to go back and read that, but this is so important because this mindset is the mindset of the new covenant. It's the mindset of the New Testament. It's the mindset of the apostles. It's the mindset of the church. 
It's the mindset of all those who have the spirit of God. We really do have the veil taken away to where we should be able to interpret and understand what the law and the prophet means. Amen. And so there's a lot of times when people think that the Torah was destroyed or abolished, the whole Torah, people think. And I don't have time to get into that because I'm going to teach on Torah at some point. But you go through the New Testament, you can clearly see, but especially Paul. Paul is not destroying the Torah. He's Torah. He's not abolishing the Torah. Okay, if you really read what he's saying, he's really showing you what the spiritual meaning of these things were. Amen. And he summarizes a lot. That's why he said, against such there is no law. What he's saying is, look, if you don't fornicate, you don't, you don't lust, you don't, uh, uh, you know, have wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, all this. He said, if you do all those things in the spirit, against such is no law. He's in other words, he's saying you're fulfilling Torah. You fulfill the law, kind of like Christ said, if you love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and stream, love your love God, your neighbor as yourself, hang this on all the law. Like the spirit allows us to keep Torah really without thinking about it a whole lot. Amen. And that's really what's amazing about it. this what was such so great about even what when he was teaching the Gentiles, who people who didn't know Torah, didn't know any of that. You know, he's showing you like, look, I'm showing you how to keep Torah in the spirit. I'm showing you how to really get to the meaning of these things and be able to fulfill these things really without sitting up here trying to understand all 600 and whatever laws that there were. Amen. Because again, the Bible clearly says just reading all those laws is not really going to always get you to the place that the spirit is going to get you to. Amen. And so where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the veil has been taken away as we go through and read the scripture. Okay. Keep that in mind because when we go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the veil is completely gone. <laughs> the revelation brought in Hebrews is all about unlocking and removing the veil from the law and the prophets. He talks about sacrifices he talks about the, the blood of bulls and goats he talks about the high priest he talks about sabbath he talks about all these things faith and it's all looking back at law and the prophets with the veil removed amen again i can't say that enough when you read the new testament you have to understand that concept you cannot understand it from this weird place of not connecting it back to the tour and not connecting it back to the Hebrew mind. That's one of the big mistakes. They also say a lot of things happen in Christianity is Christianity interprets things from a Western mind, mind uh, mindset. And so we go in with a Westernized thinking and go into the scripture. And it's like, no, this was, you got to go back to the cultural position for some of these things because they'll begin to make more sense to you. Hey, Amen. And maybe we'll deal with that another day, but keep that in mind. We want to keep the newness. Uh, of the veil, understanding um, what we have revelation about. Amen. All right. So let's go to let's go to Hebrews. Before we do that, let's look at this slide real quick. Present all right. So as I just said, we're removing the veil. So when you remove the veil, one thing you ask is what was the spiritual purpose of these things? Okay, I talked to you earlier about roots and trees and how we search things out. There's, there's so many of these deeper things you meditate on that God has done that help you understand why he did it, amen? So I've said a lot in this class, the natural always has a spiritual principle, things that God made, that's what I'm saying, the natural. I'm not talking about you know things we make, things that God has made and things that he has put in motion and he has put in the, in the, in the earth. They are things that teach us naturally, but they also have spiritual meaning to them. Amen. And so there are many different types of rest, but the scripture outlines that unbelief is what keeps people from these rests. All right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter three. Um, and we're going to look at that real quick. Because this particular narrative here is where a lot of people, um, if you go into the scripture with the mindset the Sabbath has been abolished, when you go into Hebrews chapter three, you can actually kind of walk away thinking it's been abolished. But I'm going to read it to you again. And we're going to look at really what he's saying here, okay? So let's look at Hebrews chapter three, and we're going to start down at um, uh, 
All right. Yeah, it's going to start in verse 7. Amen. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost has said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Amen. And it says, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart and have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. All right. So the rest he's talking about here is for Israel. First one, they were in the wilderness. He said they didn't follow the commands. They didn't follow what he was saying. He said, so he swore in his anger and his wrath, they ain't going to enter my rest. That, that generation right there, they're not entering in. And the reason they didn't enter in is because of unbelief. All right, it says it right here. Take heed, brethren, lest, verse 12, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all caught, came out of Egypt by Moses. Hmm. With whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to them, and to whom swear that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. So one thing you have to understand, there's some spiritual things going on now. We see Israel supposed to be entering into a type of rest, which was the promised land. He was bringing them out of Egypt into the promised land. These are all symbolic things. It's the same way in the world today. We come out of sin and we enter into rest. And I'm going to get to that in Hebrews chapter 4. There's all these parallels in the scripture. Israel was supposed to come out of Egypt and enter the promised land, which is a type of rest. But he says here they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's what keeps you from entering the rest. The rest. Any of the types of rest of God, what keeps you from entering is unbelief. All right. So he's giving you an example here. Israel could not enter in because of unbelief in the promised land. All right. And he continues. Okay. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay. He's going to continue to elaborate what he means. For unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them. Now he's switching to the gospel. Okay. He was talking about Israel because again, the veil is removed. He's given understanding about all of these things in the, in the Torah and the prophets, and he's given you clarity. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now, who is them? Them is Israel, okay? But the word preached did not profit them, Israel, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it, okay? We've heard that before. Israel heard. They didn't want to hear. We know they were going to the synagogues preaching. I'm going to get to that later. Um, but for some, they didn't believe, okay? For which we believe for we, which we have believed do enter into rest. So when you believe the gospel and when you believe the, the faith and, and you come into the faith, you enter another type of rest. This is a rest that's also been ordained, which is a spiritual rest. And we rest in the things of God. We rest in the spirit. We rest in his ways. Amen. And he said, and I, I've sworn to my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So in other words, he already had a, a place of rest always prepared for you. And this is when it starts getting deep. <laughs> so in Ephesians chapter one, he said, from the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. So these things were already established before the foundation. Well, that's when we start talking about the Shabbat. He'd say, I'm going to rest on the, you got to really put this into perspective. This stuff was already in motion. These things were already in, in thought because he's not only giving you a natural day, but he's also going to give you a spiritual day of rest. Amen. And they work together. Amen. And so he's saying here, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they should enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Here we go. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Okay. So now we're, he's bringing revelation to the Shabbat, to the Sabbath. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. So he's saying, naturally, the seventh day, he was saying, I want you to enter into my rest every week. Now, spiritually, he's saying, in this place again, verse five, if they should enter into my rest. How do you enter into that rest? By believing the gospel, verse number two. He's, he's, giving, a, he's giving two different positions. 
There's a rest when you enter the gospel and you believe it. Because again, the way you don't enter is by what? Unbelief. Same way Israel didn't enter the promised land because of unbelief. We have to believe the gospel. We have to believe in our heart that Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. And so now he's saying it was just like the seventh day. He rested from all his work. And in this place again, they shall enter into my rest. Here you go. Seeing therefore it remained that some must therein enter, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So it was preached first to the Israel. It was preached first to the Jews. And guess what? Same way they didn't enter the promised land, same way they didn't enter into the gospel, into the good news. So they didn't enter in because of unbelief. Okay. So we're in, we're still talking about entering into the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Amen. Verse seven, again, he limited a certain day saying to David today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. Now, KJ Reed mistakenly writes Jesus here. Um, it's supposed to be Joshua because okay? Jesus and Joshua is from the same word, Yehoshua. And so for whatever reason, they wrote Jesus here, but it's supposed to be Joshua. And I'll show you that if I go to compare here, uh, uh, almost every other translation writes Joshua because we're talking about Joshua and the land of rest. Amen. And I don't have to get too deep into that, but he's saying it's actually supposed to be Joshua here. Okay. And I'll show you here. Look at all these different translations. All of them say if the name here first uh, in, in TS 2009 for if Yehoshua, Yehoshua and, and Jesus or Joshua, they're the same Hebrew word. Okay. And so all the other translations have Joshua here for whatever reason, KJV wrote um, Jesus there. Okay. So if Joshua had given them rest, then they would not have spoken of another day. Okay. So they didn't enter into the full rest yet because he's still talking about another rest he was going to give. <laughs> and then it says it right here, verse nine, there remained therefore a rest to the people of God. Now the word rest here is sub as Sabbath. Okay. It says it right here. If I go to the other translation, because you don't see it, Verse nine, there doth remain then a sabbatic rest to the people of God. Okay, look in the Greek. Therefore, there remains. Go back to that verse, sorry. Verse nine. So then here you go, ESV. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Okay, so this is why. For he that is entered into his rest hath also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, we're talking about another rest. There's a final rest when we finally rest in him. This is what we are laboring to enter into. We've received the gospel, we've entered into his rest, we have the spirit of God, but now we are waiting to enter into the final rest or the rest that will come in the end. Hey Amen. I'll show you that because if you think I'm making this up, I'll show you. Let's go to Revelation 14 and 13 real quick. Revelation 14 and 13. <clears throat> and it says here, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them okay so the bible a lot of times talks about we even go to revelation chapter 22 okay he that is unjust let him be unjust still verse 11 22 and 11 he that which is filthy let him be filthy still he that is righteous let him be righteous still and he that is holy let him be holy still and behold i come with quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be amen so you got to understand <laughs> natural and spiritual the sabbath day we work naturally six days on the week to the seventh day we enter into his rest mm -mm -mm. and so he's trying to teach you you work to enter into the rest amen six days shall you work on the seventh day you enter into the rest that's the natural law Okay, and that's what we should follow. Hey, we work, we work while it is day, like Christ said, I gotta work while it is day. For night cometh when no one will work. Okay, so he's trying to teach you, guess what? Not only do you work on the natural, but now when we get to Hebrews, we see we are laboring spiritually. He said, we therefore that remain at the rest of the people of God, a sabbatic rest. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works. We haven't ceased from our works yet. We still work, 
That's why there's still a sabbatic rest. Does that make sense? It's in the natural, in the spiritual. And he said, therefore, let us labor to enter into that rest, the final rest. And I just showed you, we enter the final rest when we have rested from all our works the same way God did. When you have kept the faith, we want him to say, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. We have to do the works of our father. That's why Christ said, I do the works of him that sent me. Okay, so he's trying to show you your whole life, the same way you work six days and then rest on the seventh. Now, spiritually, we work all our life in the, in the spirit to enter into his rest, to the final rest. Amen. And so this is what he's saying in Hebrew. He gave you three different scenarios. He showed you Israel entering to a type of rest, which was the promised land. Then he showed you Israel, again, not entering into the rest of the spirit, into the gospel. And then he shows you another rest of entering into the final rest, the last rest. He's saying here, we have to labor to enter into that rest. He's not saying let them labor to enter that rest. He's went on, let us labor to enter into that rest. So he's showing you we haven't entered that one yet. Amen. And so this is the significance. This is the spiritual significance of Shabbat, of the Sabbath. This is what he was trying to reveal to his people. We have to work to enter we have to do the labors do the works of god in order to receive and to walk into that rest because again like he just said every man's going to be judged according to his works because a lot of people even when you start saying the word works you got people in christianity that start getting you know all tied up well it's not about works lest any man should boast like well, hold on a minute you gotta also remember james saying faith without works is dead okay so what paul is talking about when he's saying you know not of not of works lest any man should boast He's not talking about the law, the Torah, and the works of that being abolished. Like, because see, people always think that way because we've been taught certain things. And I'm going to go back to Colossians 2 and 16 in a minute because I want to read a couple of verses where he talks about nailing um, the, uh, the uh, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances, which is against us. We're going to look at that real quick because I want to I deal with that because there's some misunderstanding there as well. Um, but he's saying, look, it's not just of your works. It's not your works that are allowing you to enter into the kingdom of God. Again, I told you a mindset of that day that was prevailing culturally with Jews was, you can't be saved just by, really, it was really in a nutshell saying, you can't be saved just by believing in Christ. That's really what it came down to. They was like, you're, you're not saved just because you believe Christ. All right, and I'm gonna actually read, read this quote to you real quick, because I think it really sums up well what they were up against. Um, in that time, I really think it'll give you um, give you a perspective. So here's a I'm going to read this quote to you. Matter of fact, let me copy and throw it up on the screen um, so you can see it because I really want you to understand this. So I have a quote here from it's around 150 A.D. OK, so that would have been roughly about um, that would have been roughly about 60 years after the time of Apostle John, okay? And so what it means then is that, you know, like I've said in this class, I don't mean just because things are historical, it means it's true. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's true, okay? We, that's called, you know, you know uh, that's a fallacy called, you know, appeal to tradition or appeal to history. So you think just because something is old, it makes it true. That's not true. There's some things that was old that was wrong when it was old. But this, but there's a lot of things we can learn about um, the thought and the mindset of those days, which helps us to sort of get a perspective on what people were really thinking and doing. Okay, and so there's this um, dialogue that was written. It was between uh, a man named Trifo, which was a Jew, and another guy named Justin Martyr, who you probably heard of, who was a Greek that had converted to Christianity. All right, and so in this dialogue, they basically go back and forth on why you know, um, the Christian or the person who believes the gospel or whatever is saved, and then the, the Jew person responds. So this is kind of this back and forth of questioning, and it's this big excerpt. Now, whether this di uh, di uh, discourse actually happened or not, I don't know, um, but it's an old thing, and it kind of shows you uh, what was really being going on. So I'm going to paste it up here so you can see it, and please Bear with me if you are, if you don't like history and you think it's boring. I promise you this makes sense. Okay, I know when I get into the history, sometimes sometimes it can get a little uh, whatever. But so this discourse right here, this particular thing I put up is a quote from the Jew talking to the 
would have, would have been just a martyr who was a Christian. He says this, if then you are willing to listen to me, for I've already considered you a friend, first be circumcised. Then observe what ordinances have been enacted with respect to the Sabbath and the feast and the new moons of God. And in, uh, in a word, do all the things which have been written in the law, and then perhaps you shall obtain mercy from God. Wow. So why did I put this up here? This is what a cultural Jew was saying in 150 AD. This is an example of what was being said to people who was believing the gospel. This is their mindset. This was trifo. If you are willing to listen to me, he's saying, first be circumcised. Then observe what ordinances have been enacted with respect to the Sabbath. We talk about the ordinances. I'm about to get into that in a minute and the feast and the new moons of God and in a word do all the things which have been written in the law and then perhaps you shall obtain mercy from God this is what Paul is dealing with y'all <laughs> you got to understand this is what he's responding to in his letters he's dealing with this mindset these people are telling folks to know God you got to first be circumcised you need to follow the ordinances which have been enacted in respect to the Sabbath, you need to follow the feast, the new moons of God, and you need to understand and have the things which have been written in the law, and then you should be able to obtain mercy. So when you read this, again, because this was the mindset, this is an example of what was being told to believers around 150 AD, because they were still doing it. When you see this, then you can start to even more understand what Paul and Shaul, or rather, is dealing with when he's talking about blotting out ordinances. And when he's talking about, you know, the uh, not letting no man disqualify you with the new moons, the Sabbath. Day. Like, he's not saying <laughs> what we think he's saying. He's dealing with that spirit, this mindset, this group that is, is teaching this. And this is very different than what the gospel teaches. The gospel doesn't teach that you gotta first be circumcised and then understand all the ordinances and then know the feasts and the new moons and all that, and then understand all the things in the law and then you get grace, then you get mercy. That's not what the gospel teaches. And that's what Paul is telling the Gentiles. He's like, why are y'all thinking you can't, you're not saved now because and you're gonna be perfected in the flesh. He's not saying Torah is bad. He's saying you're letting people who, who believe this, that I got up on the screen, make you feel undone or like you're not even saved because you don't keep that stuff amen and that's a big difference and so i wanted to put that up here because when i was reading it, i was like oh yeah this this is good because this is what they were dealing with in that time and in that era and i want to make sure i don't get too far off course but going back to colossians 2 and 16 i want to look at that real quick because a lot of people miss uh understand i'm not going to read 16 we already dealt with that a lot <laughs> But he talks about here blotting out the ordinances that was against us. He's not talking about Torah, okay? Ordinances and Torah are two different things. Listen to what I just read to you. He said the ordinances with respect to the Sabbath. So in that time, they had not only the law or the things that were in the scripture, they had a bunch of ordinances. They had a bunch of other stuff. And that's the stuff you see Christ dealing with. And that's what I think people misunderstand because that's why I said we're going into the scriptures with a Western mindset and we're not going in thinking East, thinking Jew, thinking Hebrew. And so we're interpreting a lot of this stuff with the lens of Christ, some of the Christian stuff we've been taught. And I'm gonna get into Christianity and, and some of the things that we teach that really came from the Catholic church. We, we've dealt with that in this class, but we start talking about Sabbath and all that and Sunday, you know, there's, there's a lot of that in there. OK, but when Paul is talking about blotting out handwriting of ordinances, y'all, he's talking about dealing with dogma. OK, he's talking about dealing with all this other stuff and this cultural faith uh, being accepted with God because you really keep all the cultural ordinances, you know, and, and you're basically doing what they feel is right. Matter of fact, you can really see it now. Like, think about some of the churches we might have grown up in. You know, there was some stuff that we knew was scripture, and then there was some stuff was like, that's just this, that's just this church. That's stuff they teach here. This is some ordinance kind of like other stuff. And so what we found was sometimes that we didn't always value the leading of the Holy Spirit, but we did value if you did what you're supposed to do in church. If you was in the right place at the right time, you wore the right suit or wore the right clothes, you, you know, and, and 
and you said things the right way and you prayed loud and, and yelled it out or whatever you know we valued a lot of that stuff but then when it came to leading the holy spirit we could come into really digging in the truth and, and and pulling out and searching you know that was okay but it wasn't like always the deep thing and so we came up sometimes in this cultural church thing right where you know we felt good if we were culturally correct within our church body and we felt like people were saved if they you know not only they believe christ but also if they kept the ordinances of the church you know so if you had somebody coming in there you know and they bleed a little bit different and maybe they was right well, you know, we kind of look at them a certain way because, you know, well, they weren't following the ordinances that we established in our church. And, man, and so it's no different really in that time. I mean, the Jew, they were like the kings of this. I mean, you're talking about thousands of years of ordinances being built up. All right. Matter of fact, let's go there real quick because I want to, I want you to see this real quick. So let's go look real quick. I want to throw this back up my slides. Okay. Because I want to, I want to get to the heart of, of a couple of things. All right. So one of them is we already talked about the spiritual purpose of the Shabbat. I talked about the promised land was a type of rest. Many couldn't enter in because of unbelief. Being saved is a type of rest, but many don't enter in because of unbelief. We read that in Hebrews. And lastly, heaven is the final eternal rest, and you don't enter in there because of unbelief. Okay, that's why he said in, in Revelation, he said, but the unbelieving and the whoremonger and the liar and, 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 and they don't enter in the kingdom is what the scripture says you can't you don't enter in anything of god without um with, with unbelief amen so very good passage through hebrews it's it's really a blessing we are laboring to enter into his rest all right and i had a slide here we work to enter into rest that's what he's teaching you okay so what was work <laughs> so bible said <laughs> six days you should work seventh day you shall rest so the million dollar question really is well what is work what is that right I'm taking a sip of my coffee what is work that's the question and what ended up happening was that's what people are asking well what is work because sometimes what you find you find is all in the jew and you find it also in christianity is sometimes it's not always about what you're uh what you can do for god sometimes it's all about what we we don't have to do right i don't have to do that or do i really have to do this but can i do this and sometimes so we get into this thing sometimes where you know it's not about it's about the least we can possibly do and still be safe i don't you should never get to that place where it's like you're feeling like you're doing the least amount of things you can do and still be safe and so a lot of people in their time were asking, well, what is work? Can you define what that is? And so what you started to see was a lot of ordinances coming out because a lot of the things they were teaching wasn't in the scripture, okay? Um, I'll show you right here. Let me pull this slide up real quick. How to observe. And I got here in the imprentries, watch out for a dogma. So when we talk about observing the Shabbat, this is what it says. These are the scriptures that talk about Shabbat, the seventh day Shabbat. It's only like five scriptures that give you a rule for that day. And, and two of them are actually particularly dealing with Israel at a certain time. And I'm gonna show you this, because this is, I actually thought this was quite amazing when I really dug into this, all right? So it says right here, not to travel on Shabbat outside the limits of one's place of residence. That's in Exodus 16 and 29, okay? It says, here's another one, to sanctify Shabbat, which is part of the law, part of, part of the Torah, part of the commandment. It said, sanctify the Shabbat, not to do any work on the Shabbat, Exodus 20 and 10, to rest on Shabbat, Exodus 23 and 12, 34 and 21. And, and the last one we find is, do not burn a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day, Exodus 35 and 3. And that was most likely regarding to baking bread from manna and some other things. And we're going to get to that. Okay. Wow. You see five things up here, and two of them are mm, misinterpreted. And I'm gonna tell you why. First one, not to travel on Shabbat outside the limits of one's place of residence. Exodus 16 and 29. This was given to the children of Israel when we're dealing with the issue of manna. Okay. And so one reason we know this is not a binding law of Shabbat is because you can clearly look in the New Testament and see they were going to the place of worship on the Shabbat. They were going to the synagogue. Right? So we know it's not. When you say not travel outside the limits of your house, you you got to look at what's going on here. That, and, and this is what I was kind of saying in my notes. We have to remember 
when we study the Bible, we are dealing with not only a spiritual book, we're also dealing with an ancient and historical book, <laughs> all right? And so it's very, very important we have teachers and preachers and pastors and leaders that have the right spirit when they go into study. Because if you don't, you can misuse a lot of things in the scripture, okay? So in ancient texts, you have to be very careful sometimes because things can be written very rigid looking and it can be very rigid where it can be, you know, when we're looking at it in our, our mindset of modern time, we're like, whoa, that's whatever. But there's another kind of meaning or interpretation of that. And, and see, you will get this if you've actually read or actually looked at ancient texts in their ancient form, you will see like things in, in some of those times, like for instance, and I'm not gonna get too deep in this, but if you kind of study the history of writing, right? If you study where um, these the history of writing came from, you look at some of the older writing, it was pictures, right? It was just, it was pictures. It was like a picture of a, a, a goat or a picture of a tree, a picture. It, the picture looked like something that it was explaining, okay? And so over time, those pictures turned into shapes which turned into letters, okay? And I don't, it's such a really, really good thing to look at because I'm, I'm really into it. But what you find though is when you read a lot of these old ancient documents sometimes, they can be very rigid in, in their wording. It's not like sometimes it's eloquently put sentence. It can be rigid. It can look like, don't put your, your don't put cow by fence at night or something. It, 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 so you'll be like, okay, what, is, what does that mean? And then sometimes, you know, over time, these things have been written, described, and wrote them out, and, and things became more elaborate and became more clear. Okay. So, long story short, we, why am I saying that? Because sometimes when we read the scripture, we're not looking at it from an ancient context and we misunderstand. So, he says not to travel on Shabbat outside the limits of one's place of residence. We know that that is specifically dealing with going out for manna. Okay. Because in Exodus 16 and 29, he's, that's what he's dealing with. He's telling them, look, don't go out of your house on the Shabbat getting manna, okay? Because they he told them, even here, number uh, commandment number five, do not burn a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. That also is connected to the manna because he was like, look, bake what you're going to bake today for tomorrow is the Holy Sabbath is what he told them. He said, so look, bake your bread, bake your manna today. That way you don't kindle the fire and work on the Shabbat is what he was telling them. So another thing that was understood about kindling a fire, when they talked about kindling a fire, in ancient times, it was, it was it was regarding work. It wasn't, they're not talking about kindling a fire to warm your house. They're talking about kindling a fire to go do some work. And so even as I said last week, even kindling a fire, especially a fire that you're going to work off of, does require getting logs, continuously stirring logs, going and finding dry wood. You know, there's a there's there's things that are done in regards to that. Amen. And so I urge you, go look at these scriptures yourself. You think I'm making this up, but I'm telling you. Some of these scriptures are misinterpreted because we don't understand ancient texts and we don't understand his, historically how they were keeping these things. The key things you need to keep right here is this sanctify the Shabbat, not do work on the Shabbat. Now we're going to get to what work is and to rest on Shabbat. Okay. So now we see the scripture saying basically these three things that you're supposed to do. Then we get to the New Testament and we see the discourse with Christ. They go out in the field and they they grab a piece of corn off a off an ear of corn, and they tell them he worked on the Shabbat <laughs> because he grabbed an ear of corn. It didn't say you couldn't eat on the Shabbat. You don't see anything now. One thing that was considered work again, because again they have to keep asking this question. Well, what is work? Okay, and this is what I came up with. This is what I, I felt in the spirit when I because I'm gonna get to how to keep Shabbat spiritual. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But really it comes down to this. Don't do anything that improves your current status or your current status. When you look at what work was regarding in, in, in regards to the things of God, it's really in a zone of doing things that improves your current status. So it would mean, yes, going out and trying to make money. It would mean in the scriptural times going out and doing a harvest, not going out and picking an ear of corn so you can have something to eat, going out and harvesting your field. That's why he said, don't sow, don't gather, and don't harvest, because that's work. That is improving your state. You're storing up. You're, 
you are trying to go out and actually do all the work. And again, you don't got a farm, you've never done agriculture, you may not get it, but that's work. I know, I know what he's talking about when he says that. I know what he's talking about when he says don't sow, don't gather, and don't harvest. I know what that means. Now, but if you don't, if you don't get it, you'll think, well, that means I can't pluck an ear of corn. No. He's saying you don't do the work. Like, for instance, we just harvested potatoes. Okay, I planted some potatoes back in November. We had some good potatoes, y'all. Matter of fact, sidebar. We just had, we have a sweet potato variety that I got from a guy here. And this guy is is he's 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 a good guy he knows a lot about growing and all that he's got a lot of respect in this area because he's been doing growing for years good guy uh i got a variety of sweet potato from him he did this trial where he tested all these different sweet potato varieties and he said this one right here had the best yield all that blah 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 i was like okay cool well, i'll buy i'll buy some you know some slips from you i'm a plant so i planted them last fall um harvested some of them they weren't big enough yet because I only had them in the ground for two months, but I was really just kind of keeping them alive so I can grow them this, this spring. Because you really want to plant sweet potatoes down here in the spring. You let them go all through the summer. You let them go about 120 days. Okay. And so I was kind of what we call growing seed potatoes. Not really potatoes to eat, but seed potatoes. You basically grow them so they're big enough to have some vigor, but not really big enough to really eat. And so I can preserve them to the next season and then really go in and try to get some, right? So long story short, Grew some seed potatoes. A couple of them came out a decent size. We, uh, so I said, okay, I'm gonna cure up one of them and I'm gonna eat it and see how it tastes. And cure means you basically, after sweet potato comes out of the ground, you can't just eat it right away. To make it become sweet, you have to let it cure. So you leave it out, um, you know, leave it out somewhere humid for about, you know, eight to maybe a week or two weeks. And what ends up happening is the starch in the potato converts to sugar. It gets sweeter not necessarily just sugar sugar but like that's what makes it sweet because if you harvest sweet potato right out the ground it actually tastes very starchy a lot of people say it tastes terrible so long story short i did all that <laughs> and i baked it today um when i tell you this sweet potato and babe chime in because you you know i'm not making this up um this sweet potato was so good it was like we were eating sweet potato pie and we didn't even make pie I mean, literally, I baked this thing for 40 minutes, put a little bit of butter on it, some salt, and it tasted like sweet potato pie. Baby, am I making that up? Are you listening? No, it was fantastic. We was up in here closing our eyes. <laughs> closing our eyes. I was like, I can't believe this thing tastes that good. Okay. But I don't know why I got off in that, but I'm just telling y'all, you know, we have our, uh, we're going to have a harvest fest. We're going to have a, we're going to have a conference at some point. I don't want to say conference. We're going to have a get together, a fellowship, and it's going to be close to a harvest time so we can have a feast. That's really what's in our heart to do. We want to get back to feasting with people of God uh, and enjoying the beauty of the land, enjoying the, um, the things of God, and really being able to bring this blessing to people. Because I think, you know, in the church and the rigid seats and the cold temples, like we, we think God is that. And when you go into scripture and you look at Israel, he's like, he was... He was saying, I want to have a feast. <laughs> I, I mean, I just was reading this like, how did we miss this? How did we miss the communion? We see Christ coming and having a feast. He wants communion. He wants to fellowship with his people around food. I, so I don't want, I can get into that another day, but I thank God for that revelation because I really do think it's a blessing to people. And we've seen how it's been connecting us with people and blessing people by food, by the fellowship of eating and the things that God made. But I'm saying that to say this, I know what harvesting is. You go out and harvest, you go out, you dig up all that dirt, you get those potatoes out of that ground, you get all of them out of there. And this requires work. You when you harvest corn, you go out and you harvest corn, you bring it in, you shuck it, you do all this work. That's what harvesting is. I know what that means. And it's improving your status because you're in, you're storing up, you're improving your situation in a way where you are in, in um you are um uh, What's the word? You're not say franchising, but you are um, enterprising. That's a great word looking at too. So we try to refrain from enterprising and improving our staff. So that requires yes, going to work and trying to make money and trying to do business and trying to do all these things. And I'm gonna show you in the scripture. I'm, I know I'm right because I'm gonna show you a scripture in Amos where it talks about this. Because he didn't never say don't do business, but you. It's implied when he's talking about not to work because he knew our world was like this and all the way back in the beginning he said nope six days you're gonna work seven days you're gonna rest it's gonna be a holy day it's gonna be set apart sanctified for rest period 
Because if we don't get there, then we get to where we are now. People work every day. There is no day of rest. There is no set time for rest. It's none of that. And matter of fact, I haven't thought about this before. Like, just imagine if everybody kept that day, it would be great. We'd all be out. We'd all be off work. We can all walk around, <laughs> fellowship one another, be able to see each other. I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking about this a little bit differently, but you got to keep remembering it was supposed to be a blessing. Okay. So, we're not enterprising. We're not trying to get uh, make make money and, and, and do all that. We're supposed to rest from that, that mind, rest from that whole enterprising thought, come out of that whole getting money thing, you know, come out of this, you know, toiling thing, because that's what it is. You know, the Bible requires us to work, but toiling is a curse. It's a difference. Bible said the guy worked and he did his work. He labored. Toiling is something different. When he talks about a curse, he talks about toiling. Toiling is when you, you do all of these things because you feel like you have to do this to survive and you're really not getting anywhere. And so you're toiling, you're toiling in the field. There's a, there's a real big difference between working and toiling. And I'm gonna get into that another day. But again, when we talk about how to keep this, we're talking about don't do these things that improves your status, okay? And that is a good definition of work. So if somebody asks, well, can I cook a dinner? Can I cook me some food or make me some? I don't see why you can't, because um, you're not improving your status. You're making you something to eat. Christ showed you that. They went and ate some corn. And the other thing they dealt with, oh, you know, they dealt with him healing on the Sabbath day. What are the, go back to the regulations. Do you see anything in here about not healing on the Sabbath day? That was one of the ordinances. These were ordinances. These were, this was dogma. And if you don't know what dogma means, I'm going to show you the definition right here. Because I don't know, sometimes we don't know, even when you look in the scripture, sometimes it'll have the word dogma in the Greek, but the KJV will write something like um, tradition or something like that. But tradition is good, but sometimes people think tradition in a positive way. Um, but there's times when he's not being positive about it. He's really telling you, no, 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 not at all. This is a... Um, I'm not speaking of dogma in, in a happy way when I'm when I'm saying this. Okay. Uh, forgive me, y'all. I'm trying to find my little um trying to find a definition of dogma. Give me one second. All right, here it is. Dogma. Something held as an established opinion. Okay, that's not a bad definition. A code of such tenets. Okay. C, a point of view or tenet put forth as authoritative without adequate grounds. Wow. A point of view or tenet put forth as authoritative without adequate grounds. So sometimes dogma is not bad. Sometimes there's some dogma, some tenets, some stuff. That's, that's good. That's true. Like I said, I'm not here to knock and say all tenets are bad. I'm just saying the scripture is very clear, though, when we deal with dogma, it can be dealing with uh, things that are being said as authoritative without adequate grounds. Okay? And so this is kind of the mindset we're seeing in the time of Christ, in the time of Shaul, even in our time, okay? We're dealing with dogmas that people have established. Hey man, like I go back to that quote I just read to you a minute ago. Look what this man said, okay? Look what he told the Hebrew or the, or, or the, the Christian person. If you are willing to listen to me, first be circumcised, then observe what ordinances have been enacted with respect to the Sabbath and the feast and the new moons of God and in the word, do all the things which have been written in the law and then perhaps you shall obtain mercy. See how he put an emphasis on ordinances? in respect to obtaining mercy of god this was the mindset of that day and this is what we are dealing with in the new testament and this is why you have to understand the eastern mind you have to understand historically what they were talking about at that time because if you don't you'll go in with this um indoctrinated christian mind and you'll interpret the scriptures in that view and you'll miss it okay and so this is important so again these three right here, two, three, and four, are really the ones that 
are really kind of clear in scripture, not traveling outside your house on the day of one's resident, that was more so dealing with them going and gathering manna. Because like I said, in the New Testament, you see Christ traveling to the synagogue to preach. You see the apostles traveling on the synagogue. They left their house. So we know this is not talking about, this is not a rigid law of you can't leave your home, okay? That was the specific code at that uh, specific time. And then here, number five, do not burn a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day, Exodus 35 and 13. Again, this was dealing with Israel, most likely um, connected to manna. He said to bake your bread um, the day before, all of that. He's not talking about healing your house. Um, again, like I said, in ancient times, when they're talking about kindling these fires, it's, it's regarding work, okay? It's dealing in a different zone, okay? And I want to go back to this real quick. Do not do anything that improves your current status, okay? The reason I'm saying that is, if we look at these three commandments here, sanctify, do no work, and rest, we think of work. If we think work means physical labor, you'll miss it. Because you have to also understand, I'm going to get to my next point, which is you need to go to the Lord, uh, the uh, King of Shabbat, which is Messiah. You got to go talk to the Lord. He said, I'm the Lord over the, Sh the Sabbath day. Okay? Work changes according to generations. This is what I got here, number one. How to observe Shabbat, number one, listen to the spirit and be guided by the king of Shabbat. That's, that's what I heard. That's what I'm feeling in my spirit about this. Because we, if we don't listen to the Lord, we don't follow the voice of God on that, you're going to miss a lot of things, okay? Because again, you'll think, well, I don't, I don't work on the Shabbat. Yeah, but you know, yeah, we don't harvest and go out like that. But today we work through emails. Today I can, I can sit right here at this computer and do a whole day's work and never get up out this seat. And so people would think, well, you didn't work. Yeah, I did. Because why? I was doing things to improve my current status. I was working. Yeah, I wasn't working my body, but I was working, thinking about money. I was thinking about how to improve money. I was working my business. You were doing all these things, even though you may have never left the computer. And that's why, again, the spirit removes the veil. We got to think of these things and let the spirit lead us and give us understanding of it. Because it's very possible you to work all day and never get up out the chair. You know, and that's just the truth. So we got to listen to the spirit, be guided by the king of the Sabbath, which is Christ. He said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath day. They tried to catch him a lot of times, breaking ordinances. And he said, look, and he gave him the truth. He's like, that ain't, he, he, he just kept showing them how they were hypocrites. He never stopped keeping this, uh, the Shabbat. He just was showing them, look, you, these, some of the stuff you've enacted in your ordinances, he said, y'all are hypocrites. He said, y'all talk about not healing on the Sabbath day, but won't you go loose? your donkey from from the thing <laughs> so it's just like the ordinances and the dogma is what made this day look the way it does to people and even today when you when you talk about um the uh jews because i'm reading the book it's actually quite interesting and uh uh when you look at some of the dogma and the and the rules uh concerning the sabbath that jews follow it's not even in the scripture Every time you see, and I was reading some stuff talking about what you can and can't do, it was like, it's in the Targum. It's in the, uh, the, the Mishnah. It's in all these other things. It's like, you can't even find it. You got to go read these other things. And it's got all this other stuff in there. Not to, and it's like, well, what's, what, what, we don't travel on the Shabbat outside. We, we travel outside our house, but we don't go anything further than the Sabbath day journey. Okay. Or <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, amazing how many ordinances they have around this day and like i said before i say look this is what scripture say right here this is what i'm working with and i'm working with the king i'm being led by the spirit i'm just listening to the king it's so funny too because as we kind of had started doing it we we had to learn we were like okay we don't know we really know what we're doing we know we ain't trying to work do we uh, uh uh do some things that uh help to maintain the day yeah but one thing we try not to do is I try not to be out here trying to make money. I try not to be out here on some thinking about all my business ideas and coming up with all my business plans. And I'm like, no, we we rest. We dedicate number two. I try to dedicate time for worship, study, and prayer. Not, you don't have to do that the whole day. But he said it was, a, it was a time also for worship, time to sanctify and to remember the things of God. And it's so funny, too, because if you think about how Christians have been taught to keep Sunday. That's really how you're supposed to kind of keep the Sabbath day. It was really a time for that worship, study, prayer, not being in church all day because they didn't, they weren't in church all day. Um, but you know, 
if you think about it, a lot of times people are working and working, working all week to have a day dedicated for that, to study, to pray. Number three, teach your children the ways of the kingdom. That's just something that you know I've been doing. I haven't been always faithful and like I'm sitting up here and act like I'm Moses or Abraham. I'm not. I had to go back and say, you know, I gotta, I gotta get back to, you know, taking time with my kids in the scripture. And we do it on, we do it on the on the morning. We get up, you know, we'll read through it. I let them explain different things in the scripture. We'll go and we have an awesome. My kids love it. They have a great time with it. They be asking me, what can we do? Can we can we go through the Ten Commandments again? Can we? They love doing it. And I love being there with them. We just, it's such a great time with family doing it. And you take the time to do it. Now, you know, some Christians will say this. Oh, well, every day is supposed to be a Sabbath day. This is what we hear. We're in the spirit now. Every, every day is supposed to be a Sabbath day. Every day is supposed to be a day of worship, study, and prayer. And guess what? You're right. What's funny, though, is what people don't realize is that do y'all really think Jews weren't studying the scriptures um, most, mostly every day? Do you have people in Israel that studied the law con continually. They weren't just doing it on the, on the Sabbath day. They were doing it continually. Okay, so don't think like because we're, we switched over this new covenant all of a sudden, well, we do it every day now. It's like, well, they were doing it every day too. They still kept the Sabbath day. It was just the Sabbath day was a set apart time because guess what? If somehow through the course of life and industrialism and all this enterprising, you never dedicated time for worship, study, and prayer and remembering the God of creation, like he said, to remember, then this is the day to do it. And guess what? It always keeps it front and center. And like I said before, spiritually, we work to labor to enter into his rest in the spirit. Same thing in the natural. We worked to enter into the rest. Amen. This is why I said before in, in the times of the scripture, there was no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was the first of Shabbat, second of Shabbat, third of Shabbat fourth of Shabbat, because every day was looking to that day of rest. Because when they entered in, the only day that had the name was the, was the Shabbat, was the Sabbath day. And so they worked to enter into the rest. Amen. So teach your children the ways of the kingdom. Enjoy time with your family. Go to the park, play games, you know, just take that time and, 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 and invite, the, invite God into it. Say, you know, Father, just be with us. Lord, be with us. And enjoy that time. Enjoy meals together. I don't. I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm like, why do people think this is such a curse? <laughs> I don't get it. I really don't. After I went back and studied it, it really hit me. Like, why do we think this is such a burden? And really, what it comes down to is because we are in a war with two kingdoms. We are at war with Babylon, who wars against the saints. It wants us to work every day. It wants us to honor their system. It doesn't want us to ever take a day off. And like I said last week in Egypt, when they were slaves, they worked all the time, all the time. And this is what this world does too, because we are battling against that system. They don't want to honor this. They don't want to honor the times and the laws and the things of God. And so that's why they, that's why we battle against that. Amen. Matter of fact, um, <clears throat> that's kind of what came, it came down to when I was telling you before about, you know, when, um, the Jews did not want to work on the Shabbat. Do you know this was always a thorn in the sign of the Romans? They hated this. They did not. They were. They let them do what they wanted to do, but Rome was not trying to do that. They they were Babylon. They were like we will, why? They were like they. It irked them that they wanted. To, <laughs> they took that day to, to rest because they wanted them working. Because if you don't remember, you don't know. A lot of the Hebrews, a lot of the Jews, they had lands and they were you know kind of in a uh i don't want to say serfdom but the roman empire was 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 terrible because you had land and you could grow your own food but they would come and take most of it for the empire and so you would do all this work working this land but then you would barely get to enjoy any of it and so they would take it because you gotta think how could you support this massively large empire that the romans had and you already know the rich and those who were in the high places always was going to eat good, eat better than everybody and always have all this stuff. So they were taking that stuff from the poor, from the people who were actually working these lands. So they didn't want them resting on no day. They, they didn't like all of that. And we're going to deal with that. Maybe next week we're going to go get a little bit into the history. I'm going to show you some of this stuff because there's a reason why there's a, a stigma around this day. And it's historically because it's they didn't like it. 
And there's another reason there's a stigma around this day, and we're going to talk about that next week. And that's because in the early first, second, third century, the Christians begin to separate themselves from the Jews. And the reason is because the Jews were being persecuted. Not only the Christians were, but the Romans hated the Jews. And so there were things that were being enacted where it was like, look, Christians, you all will be able to receive, um, what's the word? Um, we won't deal as hardly with you, but you have to start getting rid of all that Jewish stuff that y'all do. Basically, in, in so many words, that's what it comes down to. I got the quotes from that century to prove it. There's points in time where they were like, we're persecuting you because y'all look like Jews, is what we're saying, because they hated them. You got to remember, the Jews were revolting. Okay, remember it talks about there were many that came up saying that they were some type of Messiah. It says that in the book of Acts. And they said he led these armies. There were so many times when they were trying to raise up armies to overtake the, Jew, the Romans and get back Israel. They never stopped doing that. They thought Christ was going to help them do that. And when he didn't do it, you know, that was one of the reasons why Judas uh, potentially, you know, hung himself. Um, but there really was a movement in, 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 uh, with the Jews who really were trying to do that. And so the Romans didn't like that. They didn't like that they had this group of people who didn't honor their gods, who, who didn't work on the Sabbath day, and had all these scruples, is what, the, what some people say, around their ways. They didn't, they weren't, they didn't really like that a whole lot. That's why they kept persecuting and deal, dealing with them the way that they did. And so in history, you see a shift between Christianity basically being Messianic Jews, who basically were just Jews who believed Messiah had come, but they were still going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And reason, I'm going to show you that next week. All throughout Acts, you see them going to the synagogue, fellowshipping. There was Jews and Greeks there. They said that they came for weeks. They said that everybody came to hear the word on the Shabbat. So it was just like, you're looking at this like, now, if that's true, then why didn't, I thought the Sabbath day was abolished. Why are they still keeping the Shabbat? And these are believers. And so you got to ask yourself, well, when did this thing switch? Amen. And so again, I'm going to end it there today. Um, but again, <clears throat> how to observe, <laughs> listen to the spirit, be guided by the king. Um, talk to God about it. Even if you don't keep it now, talk to the Lord about it. That's all I ask. Talk, talk to him about it. Keeping the Shabbat is not making you saved. It doesn't make you saved. Um, keeping the Sabbath is a blessing. It's a blessing to you. It's a time of refreshing, time of remembrance, time to reflect, uh, go out and walk in the park, enjoy your family, eat some good meals, uh, talk to scriptures with your kids and your wife, uh, whoever, whoever you're with. Go out and witness. Talk to some people you, you, know, you may not talk about. Uh, talk to normally it's so many things you can do but it's really about coming out of this systematic mind of working all the time always thinking about money how am i gonna pay for this how am i gonna pay for that how am i gonna get this money to do this the gas price is going up this is like no he created and blessed a space and time i talked about that earlier he blessed a time which is very unique because we see him blessing buildings and people he blessed a time period for you to come out of that and say, you know what? Forget all that. And it's, I'm gonna end it with this. I heard, I heard the spirit with that. This is actually a rebellion against the system of Babylon. For you to say, you know what? I don't care what y'all doing. I'm not doing none of that on this day. That's another reason why they hated them. <laughs> we, we take the position, I'm not doing none of that. I'm not thinking about the stuff y'all thinking about. I'm not, I'm, I'm not involving myself in that system. I'm not being in cahoots with that system, I'm not thinking about money. I'm not doing any of that on this day. That is one of the big blessings of it, because I'm telling you, we already know this world will stress you out if you let it. Um, there's always something going on. Um, there's always something they want you to be worried about. And most importantly, they always want you working and buying and selling. I talked about that in class before, that buying and selling thing is really big in our day. And it said it would be like that in the last day. Always buying and selling. That's all we do. Buy and sell, buy and sell. Constantly thinking about what can I sell? What can I buy? What can I sell? What can I buy? You know, come out of that on that day. We come out of that. We, we, we rebel against that system. We, we stand against that on that day. We take that time to for God. We, we let it be a blessing to us. And you'll watch how the, how the world will watch. And they'll be like, oh, okay, huh? Wow. Imagine that. Amen. So, Again, go back to my first slide. It was meant to be a blessing to you. Remember that.
It was meant to be a blessing to you. It was not a curse thing or wasn't anything like that. Or people tried to make it look, look like it's a time for you to be refreshed, time for you to enjoy, uh, reflect, to think of the goodness of the things of God. I mean, when you think about the creation, he talked about he blessed and sanctified and he stopped and he enjoyed the work which he made. You got to stop and enjoy it. You got to stop and smell the roses, as they say. Stop and enjoy the blessings that God has given you. Enjoy it with your family. Enjoy it with your friends. Um, amen.